the Democratic caucus, and it was lonely. Uh, when a, when a uh, high-level California official came to visit me in Washington, I'm not joking, I just about got on my knees and begged her to run for the Senate, not for governor of California. And she did, and she became the, the senator from California. That was Kamala Harris. And then look what she did to me. She left me. <laughs> uh, so um, I just want you all to know how good it feels to be in the Senate with four African Americans. And uh, it's never happened before. It has never happened before in the history of the United States of America that four black people are serving at the same time. And I just want to highlight uh, my two friends here. And, and not with any kind of just plaudits, I want to just give an example. Yesterday, it was a tough day of voting. A lot of real issues affecting black and brown people. We were dealing with border issues and the more. And I found myself, obviously, as usually with tough votes, talking to my colleagues, but I called the two of them because I wanted a moral voice. Because I trust them to, in so many ways, provide me a strength in tough times when we're dealing with issues. I cannot tell you how much diversity matters at a time that it's under attack. We all have to do what we can to make sure we're in the room where it happens. And so the first thing I'm gonna say, just to make everybody here feel uncomfortable, is you all have an obligation that this historical moment is not an aberration. If you are not looking around the country and seeing black people rising to the potential of being a United States Senator, and we have black women running all over this country. All over this country right now, black women right now are running for the Senate. What have you done to help them get there? That's right. If you have done nothing, not even given a daggone $5 contribution, you're part of the problem. Because King said it, it's not the vitriolic words and violent actions of the bad people, it's the appalling silence and inaction of the good people. And if you can't do something for the cause of our country because, as friends of mine will tell you, it makes such a difference to have black people in the room. Because you all know it. For so long it was about us without us. Mm -hmm. The second part of this, part B of the first point, is black staff. <laughs> you know, you know, we're not, we're not making the mistake of giving the microphone in this church. <laughs> he said, I still have the record for the longest sermon. <laughs> Ever preached. But the part B is you all, black staffers. I, I, when I got here, this was the least diverse place I had ever worked. We got Schumer to make every single Senate office publish the diversity statistics of their staff. And suddenly, black and brown people and women have gone up, shot up, in the number of people over the last seven years. But if you are serving in a Senate space right now and know of vacancy in your office, and you're not calling African Americans and encouraging them to participate or simply apply for the job, you're part of the problem. Mm -hmm. I, I really need folks on the first point to leave here saying, what can I do to make the most powerful governmental institutions of our nation really more representative? The second thing I wanna say uh, is really Warnock's uh, space. And I say it's Warnock's space, not because he's the guy that pushes people out, because he gave one of the most powerful speeches I've heard in my years on the Senate uh, on voting rights. I, I just cannot tell you the crisis that we're in. When this, in the state of Atlanta, the state of Georgia, uh, that the average black person's waiting like an hour longer to vote than the average white person. All over this country, you're seeing laws being written that are taking the gains of black history and reversing them. We are in a crisis right now, and the threat to it we all need to start taking more seriously. Because black voter suppression has been done in so many forms. There are some counties in America where one out of three or four black people can't vote because of felony disenfranchisement. There, there, are, there are so many schemes going on to stop African-American voter participation. We should be talking about this as much as John Lewis did. And the worst thing that's stopping black voter participation sometimes for me, it's the growing cynicism amongst our communities that voting doesn't matter. Because I know the difference between one vote for our communities, and it's very simple. It happened in my last Congress. We were one vote shy of making the child tax credit permanent. One vote could have cut black pop child poverty in half. So uh, well, this is Warnock, because he's so much more of an uh, articulate, encouraging, inspiring speaker than me, skinnier than me, <laughs> better looking than me, better dressed than me, dead when he came to the Senate. <laughs> so my loyalty to the African American 
issues is better. <laughs> <laughs> my vanity is secondary to my my cause for the for the purpose. I also have more hair. Yes. <laughs> My third point, uh, I, I, I had to get up and leave my staff, we were in a meeting, and I looked at my phone and I got this, but I got up and I had to walk in the bathroom because I was going to start crying. Joe Madison that died last week. And if you don't know Joe Madison, he's an unbelievable guy. He started like a lot of folks here as a young man in his 20s, youngest person ever to be the head of the NAACP out there in Michigan. He, he was this extraordinary activist that did things that set records. I mean, he literally broke Guinness Book of World's records. I hope you read his bio. His bio is stunning. But the third point about him, and I'm still shaken from his loss because I got to know him. I got to, to be involved with him, not just professionally in interviewing me, but we got to be friends. And I was even saying he was a mentor. And I remember for voting rights, he went on a hunger strike. And I didn't know he was on a hunger strike while he had cancer. And when somebody said to him, you may die, his response was, well, then I'll die. It was a level of commitment to the cause of our country that was extraordinary. So let me be Joe Madison on my third point and make some folks feel uncomfortable. The last two points, I hope make you feel uncomfortable. We talked a lot about black economic power and the fact that we are still a nation where there is such significant disparities in, in black and white differentials in wealth, and a lot of it we have ability to influence. We, we are here in Washington where there is not only the seat of power, but so many decisions are being made that create wealth in our country, but we are, are not, in my opinion, doing enough to speak up and fight for those issues. And some of these are arbitrary decisions, like who runs pension funds right. that we are, but they're paid into by black and brown people and women. Who's running them? Well, it's billionaires, excuse me, millionaires are being created through just the management of pension funds, and, and diverse managers actually produce better results, according to Barclays Bank. That's a decision made by people in power. We have to start talking about leveling the economic playing field and think about ourselves is what are we doing to fight for economic power? Because everyone from our history that I've read, from Malcolm X to Booker T. Washington, was saying that we have got to start talking and focusing on that. And that means looking out for each other. I, when black lobbyists come, and some of them I, I see in this room, I want to make sure that they know uh, uh, that, that they have somebody, I'm not always going to agree, but somebody that's over here. You've got to start looking at the issue. Last issue, because I'm going too long, make you all feel uncomfortable, is I, during, during um, I still remember this meeting, I, uh, some black leaders from America came to see me about their agenda for black America in the wake of George Floyd. And after they gave me a great presentation, I agreed with them on, on, on most all of the points, uh, I said to them, well, I don't understand why you don't have the number one killer of black people on your list. I mean, if you just look at, at person to person, the, the, what's killing most black people, and it is related to issues of race, how could you not have an agenda to stop black death? And they looked at me blankly about what we're talking about. Uh, we have on this list, we have you know uh, uh, shootings and police, and all these things they thought they covered, but one the thing they didn't cover is food. The number one killer of African Americans in America is diet-related diseases. And we have a system that's designed to kill Americans. Because you walk into a bodega in Newark, and you can get a Twinkie product cheaper than an apple. Is that the free market? No. It's not. Our government only spends about 7% of our ag subsidies Go to the foods our government tells us we should be eating the majority of. The rest of the stuff that we subsidize is highly processed foods full of sugar and causing cancer with chemicals that are banned in other countries. We don't talk about how food systems in America are, are, are killing us. We are a nation that is poisoning itself and the suffering in African American communities with diabetes, hypertension, stroke, th this is crazy. I moved to the Act Committee, and Brother Warnock's with me, because of this simple reason. 
who's making the decisions in the room that make everything in the McDonald's uh, uh, drive through which are overrepresented in our nation, subsidized so you can get a dollar meal, but then you try to get a bucket of salad and it costs 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. I'm having more conversations with folks in, 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 in communities of color, from Native Americans to Latino Americans, about why have we created and designed a food system that makes cheap, highly processed food so available, but healthy, nutritious food is so hard to get. And so I just want you to feel a little uncomfortable to think, what can we be doing to talk about these issues that are really threatening our country? And food issues have such a relation to how our children learn in school, such a relationship to what lifetime earnings are, such a relationship to, to thriving as a people. Look, we, we talk about black history, and I love looking back. But, but our, our ancestors did not want us to dwell there. They wanted us to be inspired to continue the work and what I worry about, Brother Warnock, is we're the same age. He's a little older than me. <laughs> I, can, I, can see, I can see it in his walk. He's starting to shuffle a little bit. <laughs> when we both stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance, I hear him groan a little bit more than me. <laughs> but our generation could be the first generation that lived in a span that saw the black-white wealth gap get wider under our watch. Mm -hmm. To see the life expectancy rate on our watch go down. To see the gains of my parents' generation on voting rights, on civil rights, on women's rights be rolled back. We can celebrate our history, but we gotta tell the truth about our present. And we can't point fingers at other people because our ancestors took responsibility. They knew the obstacles, they knew the challenges, but they joined arms and said, not we may, not we possibly can, not if we get permission, but we shall overcome. And so I, I just want you all to know, I love you. I love people. I love black people. I love, I love black gay folks. Folks, I love bald, skinny black men. <laughs> but but love is not sentimentality. What does love look like in public? It looks like justice. Yes. And for all of us that love folk, let us fight for justice. I, I'm <laughs> for Hip politics, baby.